Hello, everybody. Welcome back. This is The Edge of Adventure. My name is Adam Asher, and it is great to have you joining us today for the podcast, whether you're joining the audio version or you're watching the video version. Welcome to the show. Welcome. Thanks for being here. And thanks for caring about things that matter. Today, I get the privilege of introducing an organization called the Pure Land Project, and they work in Tibet and with the people of Tibet. And we're going to learn about the organization. So many things to delve into today. But first, let me just welcome my guests. I have both the co-founders of the Pure Land Project on the line today, Meg Ferino. Meg Ferino. I hope I said your name right. Meg Ferino is co-founder and executive director. Meg, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Adam. This is, I'm excited to be here. And also, Abu Lama is joining us, also one of the co-founders. Welcome to the program. Thank you. Thank you so much, David, for me. <laughs> great, to, great to meet you both. Great to have you on the show. I already have a, a lot of respect for what you guys do from my research and as I've prepared for this conversation. So now, now is when it really gets good. We get to learn more about what you do and the importance of Tibet and and the life for the Tibetan people and why the Pure Land, uh, Pure Land Project is so very important. Let's start, let's start by putting into context, though, for people who need to know about Tibet. And Abu Lama, I'll ask you this question. Why is Tibet so significant? <laughs> Tibet, um, Tibet is... Uh... You know, there's a uh, very, uh, uh, how do I say, this uh, very high uh, altitude and Tibet is very high place in the world. Uh, Tibet people is uh, uh, usually, they are uh, stay in the, on the mountain, uh, uh, winter times stay in one place, summer times always they are moving in the, uh, they are keeping uh, yak and sheep, uh, horse, they stay on the mountain. Then, uh, you know, they are uh, just <laughs> not, not, uh, not studying, uh, not much. Uh, but some monastery or there do some uh, study. But lay people, they are always taking care for animals, uh, uh, something like something like this. But any, uh, but they are very high attitude. Uh, it's, uh, summer, summers very short and winters very long. Something like this. Uh, you know, Tibet people, uh, uh, they are like, uh, uh, I don't know how to say this, uh, learning more or developing the need, but they don't know, uh, not much connection people. They are always different place, uh, something like this. <laughs> this is the edge of adventure. And we're talking Tibet today and the Pure Land Project. Two guests on the line. That was the voice of Abu Lama, one of the co-founders. And we have the other co-founder on as well, Meg Ferino. Meg Ferino, executive director, co-founder. Meg, I want to get your perspective on Tibet. Before we delve in too much to what the Pure Land Project is and all that you do, what is Tibet and why does it matter? Well, that's a very big question <laughs> to start off with. Um, and not being Tibetan, I um, appreciate Abu Lama offering his ideas around um, what makes Tibet really important. And Abu is, is from Tibet and um, has explained that it's a very um, rich place culturally and environmentally. It's one of the highest plateaus in the, in the whole world. And that makes it extremely um, special biologically and culturally. So it is, there are 
plenty of places inside of Tibet that are considered um, biocultural hotspots. And um, these are at risk of being lost at this point. And so um, that is mainly what, what brought me to this area and why I think it's so crucial that people know about Tibet. Uh, Tibet is actually the source of most of Asia's water. And that is of crucial importance to keep pure and safe for people across the rest of China, Thailand, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, India, Nepal. All of those countries depend on the water that is caught in those glaciers of Tibet, of that high plateau. And the people of Tibet are those that are keeping that water clear and clean for the rest of Asia. So those people and their traditional ecological knowledge is really precious for the health and well-being of Asia. This is the Edge of Adventure. We're talking the Pure Land Project. First question, of course, right out of the gate, we had to talk about Tibet and what it is and why it's important, because I think that helps to set the stage for why the Pure Land Project matters so much. And of course, here on the edge of adventure, we love to focus these uh, focus on these organizations and these people serving others. I like to say serving something bigger than themselves, and that uh, you know that type of conversation is uh, today certainly no exception to that. And we're getting to to know about the Pure Land Project, all that they do. So let's let's turn our attention now to some of the specifics, Meg. Uh, the Pure Land Project is focusing in Tibet, in what ways, who are they helping, and what's the motivation? So, um, like I said, Tibet and Abu alluded to the fact that Tibet is extremely isolated. Um, China, the Chinese government did come into Tibet um, back in the 1940s and officially in 59. And the um, there are is a lot of um, cultural struggle there um, between Tibetans becoming developed um, on their own terms, uh, keeping their own culture and their own land uh, in the ways that feel um, authentic for them, as well as um, making sure that the environment is, is protected. And so Pure Land Project began when my teacher, who is also Abu Lama's teacher, Garchan Rinpoche, had asked me to help with his schools that he had helped build uh, back in 2005 is when I actually moved there. And so um, when I arrived, I realized that it's such an isolated place and the people were asking for assistance with education, with medical care, with um, other social services. And I thought, you know, these people are incredibly pure and um, beautiful and do not have this uh, bridge to the outside that could actually support them um, to help get their needs met. This is the Edge of Adventure. That's Meg Ferrino, co-founder, executive director of the Pure Land Project. And also on the line is Abo Lama, both co-founders for the Pure Land Project. Uh, Abo, um, what are some of the needs that the people of Tibet have or perhaps are experiencing today? <laughs> Ditsa <laughs> Right, so Abu Lama um, is sharing about the potential extinction of the Tibetan languages. Um, so inside of schools, it's actually very difficult to learn Tibetan language. And he said that 
biggest one of the biggest concerns for Tibetans these days is actually learning Tibetan, their mother tongue, which is actually endangered. And and just to share a little bit more about why how a language could become endangered like this. Um, so as I as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese government has um, taken control of Tibet since the 1950s, and the schools are all now in Chinese medium, meaning that Tibetans do not often have the opportunity to learn how to read and write in their own language. And oftentimes it's not even spoken because a lot of Tibetans attend boarding schools. And at these boarding schools, um, they're using Chinese to even speak with each other and speak with the um, parents and headmasters and such. So this is how um, the Tibetic, it's actually a whole new group of languages, Tibetic languages are actually um, endangered at this point. And of course, the loss of a language is synonymous with uh, the loss of culture, right? One of the reasons why holding on to your original language is important is because it is a, it's a t direct tie to, to your culture and to your heritage. And um, this, so this is part then of the Pure Land Project is helping to um, keep that part alive. How do you, how, how does one com combat that? Well, it, it's very complex. Um, we had actually helped um, sustain four different local schools um, in the area where Abu is from, which is called Kam. And that's an Eastern region in Tibet. And just to locate Tibet, it's actually the high plateau north of Nepal. So that's north of India, Bangladesh, and um, you can even see it above uh, Vietnam. So that high plateau um, has a lot of mountain ranges, not only the range of the Himalayas, but many different ranges that add to different, having different language groups because nomadic people obviously travel a lot, but oftentimes within these mountain ranges. And so um, we have schools for these nomadic people in four different areas where um, Garcha Rinpoche, uh, both of our teacher, he acts as, as their spiritual advisor. And so the communities had actually gone to Garcha Rinpoche and asked for him to offer them the gift of education. And so he established these schools to be able to teach in Tibetan language and in the local villages, so these students can actually go home every day and speak Tibetan, eat Tibetan food, be with the livestock that you know is a traditional uh, livelihood for Tibetans. Either doing farming work or nomadic work are are the traditional livelihoods for Tibetans. And so um, this the. Um, the method we have been using is mainly having schools. So those are some of our school students on a, on a frozen lake in Gargun. That's Abu Lama's village. And um, also we do have winter language intensives for those students who have graduated from our primary schools and they have gone on to boarding schools in, in the cities or even college. We um, invite them back to the village so that they can um, come and study Tibetan language for the month that they have winter holiday. And so they get uh, a month of just pure Tibetan language. This is the Edge of Adventure. You guys know me, my name's Adam Asher, and I've got two great guests today. Meg Ferino, co-founder, executive director, and also Abu Lama, co-founder, for the Pure Land Project. And I told them, I told them right before we started the, the broadcast, I said, this is a very unique interview. This is a very unique opportunity. And it's one where I, I will admit I'm learning. I'm learning a lot from this conversation. And we're just getting started here. So there's, I've got a lot left to learn. I've got a lot of questions. I tell people it's easier for me because I've, I've got questions. I don't have answers. Okay, I have lots of questions. Um, but let's, 
let me now ask Abu Lama a, a question. You, you, Meg, you mentioned a minute ago about the nomadic people. And I want, for both for me and for the listeners and the viewers, I want to put this into perspective, life for the nomadic people of Tibet, the Tibetans. What is life like? And I'll pose that question to Abu Lama, and certainly, Meg, your assistance in the translation is wonderful. So uh, please feel free to do that. And um, I'll, uh, uh, because otherwise, I'm just a third wheel here. Okay. Got it, love from Meg. The Pugi Dropagi looks so country, country, they do. Uh, so Abu Laba shared that, um, you know, the Tibetan nomadic culture is um, really based on the livestock and also they, they have, um, you know, mainly yak, but also sheep and living in a tent. So the black tent is really a special symbol of Tibet. Um, and just to <laughs> give a little explanation of this, um, the black tent is actually um, woven from uh, the black yak hair wool. And so uh, the Tibetans weave this tent uh, themselves after um, you know, shearing the hair of their livestock in the summer. So um, this is really a beautiful um, symbol of Tibetan life as, as it traditionally has been uh, for nomads is that black tent. And um, he also said, you know, all of the, all of the um, foods that come from the animals like milk, cheese, butter, meat, those are the staple foods uh, for Tibetan people. And you can see all of those foods are from the female yak, dru, or with the male yak, they are called yak, or a crossbreed of a yak and a cow, which are called zo and zomo. And um, Abu Lama also shared about how the nomads are always moving in the summer, kind of chasing the grass um, so that their animals can have enough to eat. And then in the winter, they also, they usually move down the mountain uh, towards the valley uh, for, for warmth, but also for, for water and grasses. But during the summer, they move um, uphill up the mountains and they, they keep moving throughout the summertime. That's the voice of Meg Ferino, co-founder, executive director at the Pure Land Project. You can look them up at thepurelandproject.org. And as we have already established, we also have Abu Lama on the line as well. And thanks to Meg for the exceptional uh, translation, interpretation. Wonderful. Because otherwise, you know, like I said, um, and I love languages. I mean, I'm, I'm joking around. I love languages, and I find them super fascinating. And and as we said earlier, it is such a piece of, of a person's culture and their history. And I've I've often thought if if there was just if I could have a superpower, what would it be? I would just I wish I could speak every language because when you speak the language, you know the culture at a much deeper level than you do even through translation, you know, some things are just lost through translation and we do the best we can. You can't speak every language, but it is really something special when a person learns another language, a second, third language and so forth. Uh, and, you know, maybe here in a minute, Meg, I'll ask you a little bit about your story, but before we, we get into that too much, um, you know, I want to, I want to know 
the Pure Land Project. Help me understand. I'll ask this question of, of Abu Lama. Uh, why is this organization called the Pure Land Project? ดีชิงคามกีซอปากีมิงดักซองรวาตะนี้ชิงคามกีกิมเซนเชเรงาโซดีกีมิงดักซองคาริเซเนเรสเมงตงดาคาริลาบวาเรเมงเอ่อชิ
increase equity inside of Tibet so that um, men and women find equal uh, grounding. Um, because in many ways, uh, Tibetan women have a very, very hard life. Living as a nomad is extremely hard, but particularly in this area of Kham, women do a huge amount of work. They're um, not only taking care of children, which you know many people know that's a full-time job in itself, but they are taking care of herds of yak, sometimes herds of sheep. Uh, they are, when I say taking care, that means waking up before dawn to milk all of the head of livestock. So if they have, you know, a hundred head of yak, that takes a couple hours to milk. And then they have to set them out to graze. And then they have to follow them up and down mountains that would take um, most Americans uh, out of breath. <laughs> and um, then they, they usually go back to their home carrying, you know, pails of water or dung for fuel or wood for fuel. And then they make lunch for the family. Then they go back out, you know, to go fetch the yak and then they milk the yak again. So this tremendous amount of work um, causes women to have a lot of health issues that are not addressed. And so we try and offer, you know, health care um, through traditional medicine clinics, as well as training traditional doctors so that knowledge is also not lost. And on top of that, we try and um, ensure that people have um, better uh, nutrition uh, through building greenhouses and also clean water by digging wells. Um, all of the villages that we work in now do already have wells and greenhouses, although we do try and uh, keep encouraging people to, to really take care of the waterways and, and continue to grow uh, their own food. So we, we, our objectives are, are quite varied, although they all fit under the umbrella of uh, sustaining, uh, not just in a, in a still kind of way, but in an expansive way of sustaining culture so that it can grow and um, even improve. This is The Edge of Adventure. That's Meg Ferrigno, co-founder, executive director of the Pure Land Project in Tibet. You can look them up online at thepurelandproject.org. And also on the line is Abo Lama. He is also co-founder. And the next question is going to go to him. You both have made mention of your teacher, uh, Garchen Rinpoche. Okay. My apologies. I'm sure I didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, but uh, Abo, I would love, I would like you to tell me and to tell the listening audience who your teacher is and why his teachings are so important. Yeah, I'm going to talk Chukka, <laughs> Then 
no papa, pimba drigat, tennis some yapo yo patan, the neck, the cadu in at the neck, not samala, ah, cheek, send the gachida, ah, Japan Johanari, say some cheat at the neck, and deva than dimba, don't have the tava tap. Take your wall soon, don't tender it, the neck conga, catch it at the neck, a yin a pimba sent, sajo sent, that end our consent. Catch you now, you're in the catch you the Tadangato, Zambel Lenton, go delicate. Then it cheery the Yuri, the P. Chimbo, then in Katan, Matamje, then it dancing Chimbo, Ranky was on the Mato Yomari, then it comes to Chusunjate, Mala Paint, Ayata, Paint Toya, or that and that, then it catches on your written day, the Sedak Mamma will go see your real lounge. You can translate it, please. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really out of practice. Unfortunately, I haven't been speaking to Tibetan very much recently because of COVID. Um, but well, I just thought, I thought as he as he talks there, I thought let, let's maybe she needs a, a pen and a pad. <laughs> right, back of an envelope. <laughs> Hopefully, it does the trick. Um, so Abu Lama, and now please correct me because Abu Lama can actually speak English quite well. So <laughs> please do correct me when I mistranslate. Um, so uh, first of all, in, in the Tibetan tradition, uh, we have uh, tukus, which are um, an incarnate system because uh, Buddhists believe in reincarnation. So the consciousness at the time of death is brought into another being at their time of birth. So in the Tuku system, and I'm, I'm going at an <laughs> explanation of what uh, Abu Lama had shared because I, I'm thinking maybe the listeners don't know what a Tuku is. So the Tuku is then uh, the embodiment of an enlightened being uh, that has passed away. So at the age of seven, Gartrin Rinpoche was recognized as a tuku, which means in a previous life, he was the previous Gartrin Rinpoche. And the term Rinpoche is uh, directly translated to mean precious jewel, which means that a Rinpoche is generally not only a tuku, which means they are recognized as being a reincarnated uh, master, of, of uh, Tibetan Buddhism, but they are also really spiritually realized. So the term Rinpoche is like the highest um, term that someone could be given in, in Tibetan culture. So first of all, at the age of seven, Gartner Rinpoche was recognized as a Tuku. And then he began, um, you know, studying Buddhism. And when he was the age of 28, that was the time of the Cultural Revolution. He was at that time captured and imprisoned for 20 years. And that is actually where he met one of his main teachers. Um, and he, he did an incredible job practicing in Chinese prison. And so um, a huge reason why, a second reason why Rinpoche is so important is that actually he um, studied Buddhism and, and has this practice uh, that is so strong. And he um, has always focused on helping others and uh, putting others um, ahead. So um, he really embodies this practice of um, trying to remove suffering from the world, from other people. And um, no matter where he, he goes in the world, people can kind of recognize this. People recognize that he is constantly trying to benefit others. He has this mindset and he has this, um, this just um, really uh, encompassing uh, compassion and love that people can, can feel from all over. Was there anything else, Avola? Right. 
Jinping sem yona te ne devata rang sem ba devota ne gavota te yo yo ten te ten na to ten ti chemo se yo ni dobora right so the second question of why are gartron bashe's uh teachings important he says that um gartron bashe has traveled the world uh sharing the teachings of um benefiting others is the easiest way to <laughs> describe uh, the practice and, and the lifestyle, really, that Garchan Rinpoche teaches. And it um, actually brings joy and um, brings people together from all over the world that um, can hear these teachings about how to actually benefit other people to think about um, other rather than uh, the self at all times. So I think now would be an exceptional time for you to then connect us to the Institute. You guys work closely with the Garchin Institute of Tibet. So again, the, uh, the uh, website, which I pulled up momentarily on the screen for those of you watching the video version a minute ago, I'll pull that back up again, but it's uh, Garchin Institute Tibet.com. But Meg, tell us about what that is. The, the role of the Institute is what? So the role of the Institute is to share uh, the beauty of Tibetan culture and awareness of the importance of the Tibetan mountains and, and landscape um, and the protection of that very particular um, biological landscape that, that is out there. Um, the Institute is a place for not only the local people to practice their own traditions of language and culture, but also for foreigners and uh, Chinese travelers to come and actually learn something from Tibetan nomads. Uh, they're, they're really special um, language, they're special traditions and skills. So it, it is a place um, that is at the top of a mountain in, in the village with spectacular views, um, unlike any other place. When I even bring Tibetans there, they're like, wow, <laughs> this is a beautiful place. Uh, really, really special um, environment where um, we have a Tibetan uh, professor who uh, will be teaching Tibetan philosophy classes for those who are interested. We'll also be bringing in other traditions from outside, such as yoga, and um, be sharing meals together, some of which will be you know, Tibetan-inspired, uh, which is really um, a very simple uh, set of dishes, but also very incredibly linked with that land and we'll also be teaching cooking. And um, the local um, communities have also um, come up with their own classes. So there are special uh, crafts and uh, skills that Tibetan nomads possess that are um, really helpful <laughs> if anyone's interested in such things as survival skills. Um, you know, Tibetan children were the ones that taught me uh, really how to make a good fire, um, how to forage for, you know, wild mushrooms and um, wild medicines. We um, have Wood, we have um, woodworking courses because there's a tradition of Tibetan carpentry. Uh, in that picture right there, if you look in the very top right corner, there's a little white building <laughs> at the top of that, um, the top of that hill, and that's actually the institute. Um, so we we hope to share Tibetan culture in a way that actually um, invites people to um, promote it in a way that elevates its value not only you know globally, but actually for Tibetan nomads themselves, because it's very easy for Tibetan nomads to think of themselves as not possessing much, be it knowledge, um, culture, um, 
wealth, you know, and in actuality, these are some of the richest people in the world is, is I've experienced, you know, they have, they possess great contentment and joy and um, live a beautiful lifestyle of simplicity and um, really compassion and connection to the natural world. And so I'm hoping that uh, the visitors that come uh, can share in, in that learning of that uh, simplicity and satisfaction, but also share with Tibetans that actually that's of great value and something that very few people actually possess in today's culture, whether or not we have the latest iPhone and, you know, air conditioning or, you know, like heating systems inside of the house and free flowing water from the taps. Many of us are still unsatisfied deep down inside. And so learning from Tibetans, you know, really a, a deeper sense of contentment and happiness and where that really comes from, this um, selfless um, state of being as is really something that I hope that the Institute can share and, and celebrate, uh, as well as um, bringing in uh, some economic gifts <laughs> to the region. It is an economically um, poor place. Uh, people are subsistence nomads, meaning that they live directly off of their herd. Uh, many of these families don't have another income and nowadays things do cost money. They have motorcycles that need gas, that need fixing. They have solar panels that sometimes need to be updated. Um, and so we do hope that, you know, bringing visitors in, that these visitors actually can exchange not only those knowledge and skills and really sense of gratitude and, and um, learning, but they can also offer some financial assistance to this region that doesn't have many opportunities for bringing in income. And there is this um, really difficult, um, you know, urban migration that is happening. Well, of course, we support all of our students going on for higher education in the cities and attending college and getting their dream jobs. We also very much encourage people to come back to the village and, and live that nomadic lifestyle that is traditional and, and beautiful and really protecting that vast area that's the, at the top of the world, um, protecting the waters and really protecting biocultural diversity for the rest of us. Meg Fedinho is co-founder and executive director at the Pure Land Project. Also on the line, Abu Lama, the uh, other co-founder of this organization. As we're drawing now toward the close of the program, Meg, I have a, a final question. It's kind of a two-pronged question for you. A, why did you found this organization? Uh, what do I mean by that? Uh, what are you hoping to accomplish? Big picture, okay? And then the second half of that question is how can people help you to achieve that? Sure. So um, I began this organization um, really when I, you know, when we talk about co-founding an organization, I was a complete outsider that landed in this very remote village um, back in 2005. And um, as a foreigner, honestly, I wasn't very much accepted in, in this very, very close community of people until my teacher, Gretchen Rinpoche, really told them, hey, I sent this crazy American woman here. You know, she, you know she's one of my students and, and helping. Um, so first of all, Gretchen Rinpoche, my teacher, my spiritual teacher who gave me the most incredible gifts that anyone can be given. You know, he, he taught me, you know, unconditional love and um, about freedom and liberation. And he um, has set just an incredible example for me. And so when he asked me to um, offer his homeland something, I, I jumped at the opportunity. And so when I arrived and I started Pure Land Project to offer um, 
assistance in the ways that Tibetan people were asking for assistance, um, I thought, you know, this <laughs> this may continue to to grow and expand because there are lots of needs here in in this village and then in the next village and in the next village. Um, and I didn't quite understand at that point that, um, nor could I expect that this place would become a home. You know, these people that were somewhat alarmed at a foreigner showing up in their village um, would then really embrace me and call me family and um, trust me to help educate their children and help um, educate, you know, the, the village around um, plastic use and, and disposal of plastics and tree planting and vegetable growing and and that they would also, you know, educate me. You know, I, I always receive such a, a larger education just being there and uh, from the community. And so I really hope with Pure Land Project to um, try and expand that type of exchange that changed my life. Um, because I think Tibetans, um, well, you know, and not perfect, you know, have a lot of beautiful wisdom to share with the world. Uh, that is crucial for us to know at this time, uh, this time when we are seeing, you know, a climate crisis, um, how to actually live in balance, in simplicity, with happiness and um, really in in close collaboration with others. So my hope for Pure Land Project is not only really to help the community that I consider family and the place that I consider one of my homes, um, to help them sustain their own culture but also to share their culture and for other people to learn the beautiful lessons that I was so blessed to receive uh, for so many years. And um, through the Institute, I really hope to create a more sustainable way of Tibetans being able to help themselves rather than depending so much on what we depend on now, which comes into my, my ask. The Pure Land Project is a nonprofit because like I said, uh, there are very few ways to uh, actually raise money within Tibet. And so we do depend on the generosity of foreigners, uh, mainly. Uh, and so we run all of our programs, um, all of our teachers, our cooks, our headmasters, the, um, the gardeners in, for the greenhouses, the um, medical doctors, all of these people are employed through donations. And the Pure Land Project is very different than other organizations in the way that we actually don't take any overhead costs as the organization. Um, all of our board members are volunteers. And as board members, we also pay for all of our overhead costs, which we keep very low. Um, but we don't um, send out multi-million dollar mailings like you know many other organizations do um like the red cross spends you know a large chunk of their donations on things to in, you know encourage people to give more donations um we actually just um depend on the generosity of those that we are able to reach organically through uh, opportunities like this. Thank you very much, Adam, for providing this opportunity and um, through word of mouth and hopefully through through trips, through tours uh, to uh, Garden Institute Tibet. And in terms of participation through the Institute, someone who's interested in that, how might that work? Right, so, so we have the website, GarshanInstituteTibet.com, and through that website, you can see what we are offering. Unfortunately, because of COVID, uh, lovely COVID, we are unable to run tours at this moment. We are hoping that our tours will be up and running in 2022, and that we will be able to bring people um, to experience beautiful Tibetan spring and summertime. Um, to 
to come and have these amazing exchanges and all 100% of the profits of those tours actually go towards the schools, the hospitals, um, all of our other social uh, programs into that, as well as when, you know, the, the things that we're not calling profit are still deeply rooted in those communities and offering uh, great work to people that are our drivers, who are our teachers, who are cooking and uh, also just helping manage the Institute. So it's bringing jobs to this area that otherwise doesn't have many options. So in all ways, <laughs> taking a tour uh, with uh, Pure Land um, will actually assist the community in very uh, deep ways. So the final question for the interview goes to Abu Lama, and it is a two-part question. Abu Lama, what would you like to see for Tibet, and what would you like to see for the world? Okay. Tibet, you Dene charan ki zambaling na ne zambaling ki ruo kare kare yores. Ruo ma kheng Um, wish. Oh, wish, ruo wish. Hmm. Uh, that pool, pool, uh, pool na ne ruo kare yores na that pool, pool tham chila. Then pool Culture than to book year. That the kitchen body, some good dose. Then that Zambaling la Matama, she you la pinsung, Zeva. Then in Hindi, you ba. The kitchen body, the Hindu lodge. There, right? So, um, I will Lama's wish for Tibet is that Tibetan children and can have uh, Tibetan literacy really and and be able to sustain their culture so that Tibetan culture is actually sustained um, and not lost so that's his his greatest wish for Tibet is is for Tibetan culture to be sustained particularly through children and as for you know a wish for the world that is for um, the people of the world to really be able to express pure love and um, boundless compassion for one another and really to embody that that type of unbound love. And as they say in the business, that's a wrap. That's a great conversation. Wisdom, very peaceful conversation, and it has been great to get to know you guys a little bit just a little bit more and to learn about the Pure Land Project and everybody should uh, find out more by going to the purelandproject.org or the or the URL for the institute is garcheninstitutetibet.com garcheninstitutetibet.com and you can always go to my website theedgeofadventure.com you will see a post for this interview you'll be able to watch the video version from there. You'll be able to listen to the audio version, get all the links, including the links to both of their projects, the Pure Land Project and the Garchin Institute. So that'll be there. So uh, in case you didn't get a chance to write it down, or if you're not exactly sure how to spell something, all the links will be there at theedgeofadventure.com. A couple of great people doing great things. And this is this is what I do, and this is what I love to do. And every time I get to, I talk to, to people like you guys, I, I'm, I'm struck by what a wonderful thing it is when a person decides, right, that uh, their life isn't just about them, that they're called to lay their life down in some fashion for something bigger than themselves. And, and uh, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. And you hear that expressed in a variety of different ways, of course, but it's always special. And that was certainly here today as I think about you, Meg, and Abu Lama, as both of you 
have this this heart and you have the, you know you're going to this this effort you're going to all this trouble to do something for someone else for another people that may be thousands of miles away but uh, you uh, care very much for them their culture their language their well-being and it shows in every word that you've said today meg farino um uh, farino say it right adam meg farino is co-founder and executive director of the Pure Land Project, also co-founder Abo Lama. Both of them have been my guest today for the show. Thank you both very much. I look forward to talking to you again in the future. And thanks for taking the time today and thanks for what you do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>